In this lecture segment, we are talking about Flemish art during the 17th century. We'll focus on two works of art by Peter Paul Rubens. Spanish artists soaked up the influence of Northern European art because Spain ruled the Low Countries, the areas of Belgium and the Netherlands today, which are here on this map. In 1555, Spain gets a new king, Philip II, when his father abdicates. Philip was not as magnanimous as his father, and he takes issue with a large population of Calvinists who by the 1550s lived in the Low Countries. He institutes policies of punishment, torture, and death of Protestants in the North, especially after the iconoclastic riots in 1566, when Protestants destroyed religious works of art, as you see in this painting. He directs his armies in a reign of terror, which begins the Eighty Years' War, the battle between Spain and the Netherlands for the independence of the Low Countries. The folks in the Low Countries decide to fight back, and their leader is William the Silent from a noble family. He leads a revolt against the Spanish that is partly successful. The Northern Netherlands are able to get their independence from Spain and establish a Calvinist nation with religious freedom called the Dutch Republic, the Netherlands today. Their art is Dutch Baroque. The Southern Netherlands can't get their freedom and are still under Spanish control and remain Catholic, ruled by an archduke put in place by the Spanish king. The Southern Netherlands, also called Flanders, becomes Belgium. Their art is Flemish Baroque. And our poster child for Flemish Baroque is Peter Paul Rubens. His biography has significant influence on his goals as an artist and the type of art he makes. His father was a Calvinist and an advisor to William the Silent, the leader of the Dutch Revolt. His father had an affair with William's wife, and Rubens' dad was imprisoned, and he was raised in poverty for much of his childhood. He was raised as a Protestant, a Calvinist, but the family converts to Catholicism when he's ten years old. His mother moves, moves the family to Antwerp, the leading city in Flanders. Rubens' dad is eventually pardoned. He receives an academic education. He could read and write in five different languages, including Latin and Italian. And unusually, he chooses to be an artist without any other artists in his family. He sets about a career using art as a tool to bring peace to Europe by creating works of art to support monarchy and the church. He also travels as a diplomat, working hard to bring peace. Keep in mind that his entire life occurs during a period of war. War was all he ever knew. He made four surviving self-portraits. We see a double portrait of him and his first wife early in his career on the right, and a later self-portrait showing himself as an affluent gentleman. Rubens establishes a large workshop in Antwerp with apprentices and students who emulate his style. He spends years traveling in Italy, soaking up the works of art we've already stu studied, creating a huge library of drawings, which you see on the left in the next couple of slides, like the Lyocoan, the Belvedere Torso, works of art by Renaissance artists like Michelangelo, and oil sketches of paintings by Baroque artists like Caravaggio. This is Caravaggio's entombment on the right. Just after he returns to Antwerp in 1609 or 10, he receives a commission for this altarpiece. It's a commission to replace an altarpiece destroyed in the iconoclastic riots in 1566. It's for the high altar of a church. It's no longer in situ. You can get a feel in this image for its size and overwhelming grandeur. It initially also had paintings below and above. The primary iconography is the elevation of the cross, as the cross moves up and away from us to then go down into the ground. We can see how he soaked up what he saw in Italy. The figure of Christ resembles the hulky musculature of the Belvedere torso, Hellenistic sculpture like the, Ly like the Lyoko Juan and Michelangelo's work. Like Durer, he merges his Italian learning with his northern training. We see naturalistic textures in the metal, in hair, in fabric, like we saw in the northern renaissance. The scene is governed by this dramatic diagonal that leads the viewer into the work and also gives the viewer a place to join the work here, as if the viewer's sins add to the burden of Christ and the necessity of the crucifixion. Like Bernini, Caravaggio, and Velazquez, Rubens pulls the viewer in and plans how he wants the viewer to engage with this work of art. He specifically wants to create an image that helps the viewer feel, to have that emotive experience linking the viewer to the church, fulfilling the mission of the Counter-Reformation. It's a dynamic image that celebrates sacrifice with the intention of, again, making the viewer a witness and a contributor to the scene. And when the viewer stands in front of it, it really is overwhelming and creates the sort of palpable religious experience the church wanted. Rubens creates a huge triumphant triptych that declares the victorious nature of Catholic Christianity with a heroic Christ who will most certainly triumph over death. Rubens also created works of art to support monarchy, as he believed the best chance for peace was through strong monarchs. 
1621, he received a commission from the Queen Mother of France, Marie de Medici, and yes, she was a Medici from Florence. She was married by proxy, meaning that her bridegroom, King Henri IV of France, could not attend the wedding, and sent an advisor in his place to make the vows, under the dome at the Duomo in Florence, actually. Henri IV is assassinated in 1610 after they had six children, including Louis XIII, the heir to the throne. Marie becomes the regent of France until her son Louis XIII comes of age. He sends her into exile in 1617, and she comes back in 1621, and she wants Rubens to create a series of images to help her not get exiled again and to help improve her public persona. Rubens is tasked with creating a series of paintings of her life that make her look good in a huge painted PR program. Keep in mind that there was no visual language and iconography to support female leaders. It's the same issue we saw with Hatshepsut. Art gave Rubens visuals to support male leaders, but not female leaders, so he creates a language and chooses allegory. An allegory is an image that has a deeper meaning and uses symbols, often personifications. He harnessed mythology, emblems, and religious imagery to make her look good. This is the room at the Louvre filled with this series, though it was painted for the newly built Luxembourg Palace in Paris, where Marie would have had an advisor stationed to interpret the images for viewers and dignitaries who came to the palace. In this painting from the series, Henri IV receives Marie's portrait as part of arranging their marriage. In true Rubens style, we see naturalistic textures and details. Look at the metalwork and drapery, exuberant figures and bright colors. Henri IV seems completely enamored with his prospective bride. The allegorical language tells us how to read his reaction. Two gods of love present the portrait to him. A personification of France with clothes covered in the fleur-de-lis whispers in his ear and tells him how lovely she is and what a wonderful queen she will make. Above them Jupiter and Juno, the king and queen of the gods, who we recognize with their eagle and peacock symbols, show marital concord. Juno is the goddess of marriage, as they too support the match. This is the best thing for France, and certainly appears to be a love match for him, motivated by affection, not by her large dowry or her Catholicism, which helped make up for his checkered Protestant past. He had been a Calvinist. Rubens uses his vast knowledge of art, mythology, and iconography to craft an image that shows Henri IV as enraptured by his bride, and if he liked her, shouldn't the rest of Europe? Didn't she do her job as queen by bearing him six children in ten years before his assassination? And shouldn't France and her son Louis XIII, the king, like her too? And shouldn't she then be in her child's good graces and retain her place in court and not be exiled again? Alas, though, even the abilities of Rubens were not enough to save Marie, and she's banished ten years later. She goes to visit Rubens in Antwerp and then settles in Germany, oddly dying in the house where Rubens' family lived years before. Rubens did his very best with the formidable arsenal of art knowledge and skill he had at his disposal. Rubens tries to bring peace to Europe using art, supporting the Catholic Church and monarchy. He blends his origins as a northern artist with his knowledge of Italian and classical precedents, creating bold, bright, celebratory, and smart images.